And good morning. All right, you rowdy, rascally bunch of people, find your. <laughs> it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Going to have a little bit of a change this morning. Kevin is on his way to Florida to enjoy a well deserved vacation break. Uh, so I'm going to try my best to step into a very large pair of shoes this morning. Uh, so I'm going to change the format just a little bit here this morning and go ahead and do the, uh, the welcome. Let you know it's great to see you here this morning. I've already seen and met a couple of visitors here this morning, so we want them to know that it's definitely our honor and privilege to have them here visiting with us. And we're so thankful that they chose uh, Anchor to come and be a part of our worship and our fellowship this morning. And if you are visiting with us for the very first time, Welcome, it's great to have you with us. And we're gonna ask you to do one thing. We do not stand our visitors up. We do not point them out or embarrass them in any way, shape or form, but we do ask them to do one favor for us. And it's on your way out this morning. If you look on the table in the foyer, you'll see a blue guest card, just like the one that's up here on the overhead. If you would take just a moment and fill that out for us, leave it sitting right there on that table. We would love to have a record of your visit with us this morning. Now, perhaps you visited with us and uh, you're, you, are you, during your visit you find something that intrigues you about our church. You want to learn more about it. If you do want to learn more about Anchor, simply put a note on that card. We'll have one of our members schedule a time that's convenient with you. They'll come out and share time with you, answer all of your questions, and hopefully one day you'll be filling out this white card, which is sitting down here by my by my feet, which is our newest member card. But again, visitors, welcome. Great to have you with us this morning. Congregation, always great to have you here this morning. We had a great leadership conference yesterday, big breakfast and everything, wonderful time. Uh, and then again, having you here this morning, it's always good to start off the week uh, in God's house with God's people, singing God's praises and listening to God's words. So I'm going to change it up just a little bit before we go to our, our welcome. I'll ask Pastor Jim if he would to open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll go to our uh, our welcome, and then into our praise and worship. Pastor Jim, good morning, sir. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for the privilege of prayer. God, to be able just to um, come into your presence, Lord. And God, we pray and just give you glory and honor and praise and, and lift you up, God. You are everything. You are awesome and mighty and strong. And, and just, we, I fall so short, God of having words to glorify you. God, I pray that you would meet with us, God, in a special way this morning, God, that you would open our hearts, God, that uh, we would be open and worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, and that, God, you would take your word, God, and place it in our hearts, God, and may it be a seed that would grow our faith, Lord, as we come closer and closer to you. God, we love you, we thank you, we praise you in the name of Christ our Lord and our Savior. It's in his name we pray. And amen. Amen. So if you would, let's go ahead and stand up. Let's turn around, make sure we meet and greet everybody, and then join us as we sing, My Life is in You, Lord.
Lord help and offer help my day. Preach, help, but do everything, help us, Lord. Amen. 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 If you would please be seated.
contains a lot. It contains a lot that can distract us and pull us away. But Father, help us to realize that our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in this life. That our hope is in Jesus. And Father, as we go into your word this morning, we just pray that you will use Pastor Jim, as you always do, to open up that word. Father, to break it down and to speak through him that message that we need to hear. We ask you to challenge us and change us enlighten us and father direct us with your word help us to take that which we hear and that which we learn apply it to our own lives first but then also find out how we might share it with somebody else for that which you give us is not ours to keep it is ours to share and what a joy it is when we share with somebody who realizes that they need god they need jesus as their lord and savior and they make that decision to change their eternity because we took time to care and we took time to share. So we just thank you for the time that we've had. We've lifted up our praise. We've lifted up our prayers and petitions. And Father, we've just given our hearts to you in love. So now speak to us as your children through your word. And may you be honored and glorified in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is where we'll have our text from uh, this morning. Uh, I would like to again say welcome to everyone, uh, both uh, uh, new faces and, and old faces. Um, uh, welcome. It's good to be in God's house with you. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. We had a wonderful time at the leadership conference yesterday morning. Uh, we had a, a great, um, uh, the food was great, and uh, it was just a great time of fellowship uh, in God's word as well. Uh, don't worry if you missed it. We're planning on that being an annual event, so uh, mark it on your calendars for next spring. Uh, we'll be having another leadership conference and, and would invite you to come and be a part of, part of that. And um, this morning, Romans chapter 5, verse, we're going to begin reading at verse 1. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace. With God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exalt in hope of the glory of God, and not only this, but also exalt in tribulations, knowing that tribulations bring perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For the one, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only through, not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, we have now received reconciliation. This is a comforting, very comforting passage of Scripture, very encouraging passage of Scripture. Stress. Hit a nerve, right? Stress, we all have it. We don't want it. And everyone's looking for a way to relieve it. That pretty much sums up the culture that we live in, right? Stress. We're, we're all facing stress. But when we say that we don't want stress and there's too much stress in our life, really what we're saying is, is that we want peace. That's what we're saying. That something's interfering. Something is, is, is damaging the, my peace. <clears throat> because let me say from the beginning that there's always going to be stress. That's the world that we live in. That's the life that we live and there's always going to be difficult times, but that does not rob us of the peace that we have with God. No amount of stress, no amount of 
cultural events, not a, no circumstances can rob us from the peace that we have with God. That's the message. It would be a mistake to quantify peace and happiness together because they're not the same. There are certainly times in our lives as believers that we're not very happy with life circumstances. But it doesn't have to affect our peace. They're not the same thing. Happiness fluctuates with our emotions. While peace is something that can be had despite circumstances. Paul points to the Romans, here in Romans, he, he, concerning peace is not about getting along in the world. And, and I think we have this misconception that, you know, if, if, if we have uh, trouble, if there's difficulty, if there's, if there's something we're concerned about, if something is, is working on us, then, then that equates to us not having peace. But that's really not the stress that man has. We have lots of that difficulty. But the only true stress or conflict in a man's life is the problem that we have is that sin separates us from God. That's the stressor. When our lives are not right before God, that's the only thing really that stresses us. That's, that's what we need peace. Because the peace that God gives us will overcome any other stress in our life. If we do not have peace with God, note this, then we don't have peace. Or we may have a temporary um, time of, uh, of, of vacation, of downtime. But I promise you, in the world that we live in and the life that we live... It's only temporary. But the peace we can have with God is eternal. Because the only true stress that we have is that we are separated from a holy God from, by our sin. That's the real stress of man. Because if we do not have peace with God, we do not have peace at all. If we have peace, but if we have peace with God, there is no circumstance... No event that can separate us from the peace that we have with God. It doesn't matter what life throws at us. If we have peace with God, we have peace with God. There's no circumstance. There's, no any, there's nothing you can even imagine in your life that can separate you from the peace with God. So, Pastor, I, in my life, I've got so much stress right now. I've got this going on in my family. I've got this going on at work. I've got this going on at church. I've got, I got all these things going on, and I'm just stressed beyond measure. We have peace with God. If we have a relationship with God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. And none of those situations, and no amount of work, and no amount of, 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 of overwhelmingness of the world can take that piece away. <clears throat> and now in chapter 4, the preceding chapter, before our text this morning, Paul uses Abraham's relationship with God through faith to show us that justification is by faith. He says, now for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited to us who believe in him and who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our wrongdoings was raised because of our justification, justified before God. It is through faith in Christ and Christ alone that we are justified before a holy God. Church, that is not a shaky proposition. That is not something that we have to, well, I wonder if we try this, at, or, or I wonder about this idea, this pre precept. That is not an idea or a precept. That is a fact. That is a truth from God's Word. That believing and trusting and knowing Christ as our personal Savior justifies us before a holy God. That's, 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 a, that's a truth. That's not a speculation. 
There is conflict between God and man. And the only way that peace is brokered is through faith in the finished work of Christ. As we can then stand justified before God. How could a man ever be justified? But we do. We have a justified peace. We were introduced to God's grace through Christ. Without Christ, we cannot see a way to have a relationship with God. There's no other way. And we say that often. I know, I know you hear that often from this, from this pulpit, from the podium down there, and any time we gather, that there is only one way to have a relationship with Almighty God, and that's through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will die saying that over and over and being repetitive over and over and over because Christ, crucified, risen again, is the only way to have a relationship with God. And you're going to hear that, you're going to hear a thousand different other ways that you can live life and that you can, that you can know God, and none of them are true. Nothing else but Christ crucified and risen again. Nothing else is truth. It's all false teaching. If it's minus Jesus, then how can we stand justified before God? God is holy. We are not. So how are we going to stand before a holy God justified in who we are, if not for Christ? How could man ever justify himself before God? How could we ever know the grace of God but through Christ? In Romans chapter 2, verse 6, it says, it says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been, listen, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. We are justified before God not because of our works, not because of anything we've done, not because any any ideas or, or plans that we have come up with. We are justified before God because of the blood of Christ has been applied to our lives. He was the perfect sacrifice, the propitiation for our sins. He was everything for us. How could we ever find peace with God apart from being justified through the finished work of Christ? How could we ever stand before a holy God? But in that justification, we have peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Given our own merit and who we are, how can we ever have peace with God knowing that God is holy and we're not? If we're not for the justification that we have through Christ. <clears throat> In Romans chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Though whom we have obtained an introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we celebrate in hope of the glory of God. This word introduction has a little deeper meaning than, it, than kind of we take on the surface. An introduction, we, we think of an introduction is that, you know, we know somebody and we, we know two people and, and we introduce that person to another. And it does have that same connotation, but it's deeper than that. Because this word... It's prosagogy in the original language, and it, it means to give access to, or in this case, it means the only access to, the only one that can introduce. It's not just random. It's the only person that can make that introduction. It's the only person that knows both parties. And when it says that we are introduced by, to the grace of God through Christ. He is the introducer. He's the only way. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Christ Jesus. He's the only way and the only one that can introduce us to grace. Therefore, having been justified by faith, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace. 
He's the only introducer of grace and a relationship with the Father. This would have been unthinkable to the Old Testament Jew. They, they would have just, that would just have been un, unimaginable. They, they wouldn't have been able to get their, their, their minds around that because they were so um, attached to the Levitical uh, uh, practice of sacrifice and, and they were so attached and, and so uh, hold it. This would have been so strange to them to even consider the, the, and, and to grasp what it meant by the introduction of grace through Christ. But this is still unthinkable. Now that we see that we are certainly unworthy and that we are unholy and we are unrighteous to be introduced to a holy God. But Paul writes that we are introduced by faith into his grace. Believing and trusting and our faith in Jesus Christ introduces us to God through Christ. Paul writes that we are introduced to that faith. Undeserved introduction. Grace means that it was undeserved. And yet Christ died for us. Paid the ultimate sin. It was a propitiation. He, he died. Uh, we, were, we were participant in that. Christ died and rose again. And he invites us into himself. And church, that hope that we have being justified before God through Christ, that hope is what brings peace. That's where our peace is found. Our peace is, is found in the justification that we have in Christ. Hope is what we have when the whole world is falling apart around us. I know things are bad. There's a war going on. Do you know that? You turned your TV on recently? Open the news. We don't open newspapers, right? <laughs> open the screen. There's a war going on. And what we might not see anymore, there are multiple worlds, wars going on right now in our world. There's one that has a center stage right now and should. And God help us to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Ukraine. There's war going on around us. There's sickness and disease. It seems to me, and maybe it's just me, but it seems like to me, people are sicker. And I'm not talking about COVID. It seems that people are just sicker. We're in a tough time. But our hope in Christ is our peace in the midst of all of it. Hope is what we have when our whole world's falling apart around us. Hope is what we have when the enemy strikes a blow to our lives as individuals. These powerful attacks by Satan on our lives individually, when they just get pounded and pounded and pounded by, by all the things and the wickedness it's hope that gets us through. It's hope, the hope that we are justified through Christ. That is our peace. Hope is why we get up in the morning. Believers always have a reason to get up in the morning. Always. Because you got up this morning. Because God wanted you up this morning. And so he has something for you. And there's peace in that. And there's hope in that. But the world does not know or accept this peace. It doesn't know it. And why, you know, it's, it's almost a running joke, right? If someone asks, if you could wish for anything, what would you wish for? I would wish for peace for the whole world. <laughs> but if that's true, if that's really what your wish is, then you'd tell people about Jesus. Because that's the peace the world needs. And there's no government entity that can provide peace. Only God can do that through His Son, Jesus Christ. 
It is our strength. It is our hope. It is our peace. Hope is why we get up in the morning. Hope is what brings peace with God. And the hope is in the person of Christ. <clears throat> By grace, Jesus introduced us to God, justifying us before a holy God. Now standing in the hope that we have, we have peace with God. The world doesn't accept that. The peace that we're talking about is not peace over the stresses of everyday life. That's not the peace that we're talking about. We have a stressor. We have something that's much bigger than, than, than whether I can pay the bills tomorrow or not. We have stressors that are bigger than if I have cancer, that if I have whatever disease, if I have a heart problem. We have stressors that are bigger than that. And I know those are big things, and those are things that, that overwhelm us in life. I know that. But the greatest stressor of man is not having relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Not being justified before a holy God because of our sin. The worst thing of anything that can happen to us that the world would label is that we'll die. The greatest thing that happens to a believer is that we die. And we go into the presence of Almighty God forever and forever. You see how it takes the stress off? You see how that we have peace when we have a relationship with God through Christ. We are justified before a holy God. That gives us hope, which gives us peace through any of life's situation. How or why would believers stress over worldly things? We know that we have a God that's in charge. We know that God that is all-powerful. We know that there's a, we have a God and we have a relationship with a God that knows everything. Nothing going on in your life or anywhere else in this world that God doesn't know about. And that he doesn't have in the palm of his hand. That brings hope, doesn't it? That brings peace. And not only that, Paul says that we exalt in such things even tribulation. Look at verse 3. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because of the love of God. This word tribulation is a word that is used to describe something that has been pressured, that is being pushed down, that has been pressured over and over kind of like an olive or a, a wine press is what they would have identified it with, is this press. And you know when you're using a press, you know, you, you, I don't know if any of you have ever, ever done it be, before, but um, uh, I've, I've done it with uh, we've done it with apples. You ever made apple juice? You, maybe you have it or, or whatever or, or, um, or any kind of juice or anything. You know, in, in a press is that you turn, you turn it till it reaches... So it gets tight, right? No, you go further than that. Because as soon as it gets tight, now you're beginning to press, right? So you keep turning. Keep turning. And it gets a little tight. It keeps getting tighter. Sometimes it feels like it can't go anymore. And then you still, because you want to get all of it out. That's, that's what tribulation is. It's much more than just having a, a, a bad day. Tribulation is whenever it's pressing down and pressing that when you feel like you can't take any more, it pushes some more. That's tribulation. And Paul says we exalt in such things. How can we exalt? How can we feel like we're uh, and have hope and peace when we're at our limit and it just keeps pushing us down? And feel like there's no way of escape. And we can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. Have, we, have you ever made that statement? I can't take it anymore. I'll tell you a quick story that has just helped me so much. And, and I don't even think my father was even meaning to give me this, this godly principle whenever he was sharing it with me. Maybe you've been down this road yourself, but I was probably, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years old. And we were driving. I could take you to the street that we're driving on, me and my father. And you ever been driving, and I've done this since then, you ever been driving and the sun was so bright you couldn't hardly hold your eyes open? 
to see the road. I mean, it's so bright. You put the visor down. You don't have any sunglasses. And it's just so bright. It's just pouring on. And, and I was sitting in the passenger side. And I said, Dad, I said, how are you keeping your eyes open to, to, to see to go? And he said this, these words to me. He said, son, he said, you'd be surprised what you can do when you have to. And that's always resonated with me. And when I, when I think about my heavenly father, when we are being pushed and pressed and in the midst of that tribulation and feel like we can't take it anymore, I feel like God tells us, you can do it because you have hope. Because I'm with you. Because you have to. I have you in this situation for a reason. God says we can exult in these tribulations because we know. That's what he says, because we know. And not only in this, but we also exult in tribulations knowing. Because we know something. That's why we can, that's why we can endure through these things. What is it that we know? That these situations give us endurance. That these situations, these tribulations, they have purpose. They're not just to beat us down or for punishment. Or, that's, not, that's not why tribulation comes into our, our lives. There's a reason for them. Because they build, us, they build up endurance. You know, in a marathon runner, when you're preparing for a marathon, I've never prepared for a marathon, never intend to prepare for a marathon. <clears throat> but I kind of know a little bit about what, how that works. I know this, that if you're going to prepare to run a marathon, you're not going to go out tomorrow and start running 26 miles. <clears throat> if you do, you'll die. <laughs> I would. My start would have to be a couple walking laps around the yard. <laughs> That's where I'd have to start. But where you start doesn't matter. Because you start walking around, and then you maybe in a little while, you run a couple miles. And then maybe your training routine takes you up to three or four miles. And then maybe 10 or 12 miles. And I don't know, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not an, a, a, a runner. But I don't know from what I can ascertain is a marathoner doesn't as they're training, they rarely run 26 miles. But they run this incremental in such a way that it builds up endurance. It builds up their endurance. So when it comes time to run the race, they're prepared. That's what tribulation does. That's what he says. He says, through also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand and exalt in the hope and glory. And not only this, but we also exalt in tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings perseverance. And perseverance brings proven character and proven character hope. And so as tribulation mounts and we find ourselves in difficult life situations, we've been through tribulation and God has been there for us and he's strengthened us and he's, he's caused our faith to increase. We can face anything. Do you know that? In the power and the faith of Christ, there's nothing that we can't face. You remember David, right? David stood before Goliath. Well, don't go there, Pastor. That's a children's story. Really? That's a real event. David stood before Goliath. Goliath's huge. David's small. Goliath, do you know this? That Goliath's spear was bigger than David? His weapon was bigger than David. It was insurmountable. You're talking about tribulation. But David never once felt like he was in trouble. Do you notice that in the story? It's not that David, you know, went up and, and you know, and I don't know if I can do this. And all. He, it, that never was the case. As a matter of fact, David criticized the rest of the army and said, I don't understand 
How do you stand here when this man defies the armies of God? David's faith in God. David had been through it, right? He'd, he'd wrestled a bear. He killed a lion. You see, he had been in the press. He had been through the tribulation. He had been through the troubles and the trials. And it prepared him for this difficult task that was before him. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in the justification that we have before God in the person of Christ. And there's nothing, no tribulation that can separate us from that peace. In verse 5, it says, And our hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Church, we have peace that goes beyond understanding of this world. This world can't understand. Unless you have a relationship with God through Christ, you can't absorb what this peace means. It's indescribable. We have a peace, a hope, and the love of God that's been poured into our hearts. Listen to the scripture. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, listen, in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? It doesn't matter the peril. It doesn't matter the size of the tribulation. We have hope. And in that hope, we have peace. Because that hope... In Christ is what brings peace to our life. That is our strength. And that's what brings peace when we're pressured and overwhelmed. Church, we're justified in our peace because of the work of Christ. We have peace that goes beyond comprehension in the midst of tribulation because of the hope that we have in the love of God that has been poured into our hearts. Church, we have hope and peace before we knew we had hope and peace. Because Christ died at the right time. I love the way the scripture bring, put, just, that just jumps off the pages of scripture in verse 6. It says, while, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Right on time. In God's timing, He sent His only begotten Son to die for us. I've heard this statement before, and I know many of you have too, when trying to invite someone to service or even to witness to them concerning Christ. And the response is, well, that place is full of hypocrites. You ever heard that before? I know them. I watch them. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. Oh, I see them towed off to church on Sunday morning, but, but that's not the life they live. They're a bunch of hypocrites. I don't see any difference in them and anyone else. Well, first, shame on us because they should be able to see a difference. But the first thing we want to do is go on the defensive, right? You're wrong. You're wrong. We're good people. The truth is we're not good people. We're not. The answer is you're right. <clears throat> We're a messed up bunch of people. That's why we need Jesus, and that's why you need Jesus. It's because we're not perfect, because we have failed, because we have come up short, because we are unrighteous. That's why we need Jesus. Because our hope is not in who we are. Our hope is in who He is. And in Him... We have peace. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Some people would die for other people. Good people. Righteous people. 
But Christ died for us while we were missing the mark. It even says that some would die. You know, some people would die for And we have. We, we know of people that have died so that we could be free, so that we could live free. We have people who have given their lives for the cause of freedom in our country. I'm thankful for that. The scripture says that for, for some, some people would, would die for good people. Jesus didn't die for good people. He died for sinners. He died for bad people. He died for the unrighteous. There was no need for him to die for righteous. But he gave his life for the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, when we were missing the mark altogether, we wasn't even aiming at the target. He died for us. Some people would die for other people, but Christ died for us while we were missing the mark, not coming short. We weren't even shooting at the right target. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love towards us. For God so loved the world in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's grace. Church, our hope, therefore, our peace does not rely on what we are able to do, but what God has done. Our peace with God does not rely on what we're capable of doing, but what God has done through His Son. There's a major misview and misunderstanding that God came to save us from this wicked world. Even his disciples questioned Jesus when he was going to set up his kingdom. Church, Jesus did not come and die for our sins to save us from a wicked world. Christ came to save us from the mighty wrath of God himself. Let that just sink in just for a moment. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wickedness of this world. No, it says from the wrath of God through him. The wrath of God is being poured out on sin. But because of a relationship and the blood of Christ applied to our lives, we have hope. So do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden, that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, tell in the light, and when you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim on the housetops, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but be able, but are able to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's Matthew chapter 10. Ephesians 6 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And again in Romans chapter 8, what shall we say then? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, how will he not also With him freely give us all things. Who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who who condemns? Christ is he who died, but rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation 
or trouble or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's our hope. That's our peace. Church, I know that the stress of this world can seem unbearable. It truly can. As if that wine press, that olive press is just, just, con- just keeps torquing down on our lives. I know that we can find ourselves, but peace is so close to us with Christ. Know that we have hope and we have peace with Christ because we are justified before a holy God. I want to close with this verse of Scripture and then we'll pray. Much more than having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also celebrate in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We have peace with God through Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for the peace that we can feel in our hearts, God, uh, regardless of life circumstance, the events are all going around us. God, we do pray for those who are struggling so today. Our brothers and sisters across the world, God, who are in such physical danger. God, we pray for them and for their protection. But most of all, God, we pray for peace. Not peace as the world sees peace, God, but we pray for peace that comes only from you through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to take your son his word and his truth and proclaim it in a lost and dying world. It's where true peace comes from, God. We know that. Help us now, God, just to worship you in spirit and truth and that, God, that you would give us the peace that goes beyond understanding. It's in your holy and wonderful name we pray. And amen. Christ as your Lord and Savior. That decision might be to rededicate your life to his ministry and his purpose. And perhaps this morning you've decided that this is the church where you want to become a member. You want to make that permanent this morning. Whatever your decision is this morning, we're just going to ask you to stand with us. Sing as we sing, empty me of me. If you have a decision, Pastor Jim is at the front. The altar is open. It's up to you. share in fellowship, in prayer, in praise, and song, and Father, to open up your word. What a sweet time it has been to be in your presence and to hear from you. So as we go, Father, we just pray that you would continue to watch over us throughout the week, that you would keep us safe, that you would guide and direct the paths that we have and that we walk, and that you would help us again, Father, to always be what you would have us to be. Help us to be aware of those opportunities when you present them. And then help us to be bold, ready, and willing to do what you need us to do to further your kingdom and your name's sake here upon earth. Again, Father, thank you for the wonderful time that we've had. Now go with us, but continue to be praised, honored, glorified, and lifted up. 
and receive all the honor and glory due to you and you alone. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.